Love on the Bon Dieu by Kate Chopin Upon the pleasant veranda of Pere Antoine's cottage that adjoined the church, a young girl had been seated awaiting his return. It was the eve of Easter Sunday, and since early afternoon the priest had been engaged in hearing the confessions of those who wished to make their Easter's the following day. The girl did not seem impatient at his delay. On the contrary, it was very restful for her to lie back in the big chair she had found there and peep through the thick curtains of vines at the people occasionally passing along the village street. She was slender, with a frailness that indicated lack of wholesome and plentiful nourishment. A pathetic, uneasy look was in her gray eyes, and even faintly stamped her features, which were fine and delicate. In lieu of a big hat, a barrage veil covered her light brown and abundant hair. She wore a coarse white josie and a blue calico skirt that only half concealed her tattered shoes. As she sat there, she held carefully in her lap a parcel of eggs securely fastened in a red bandana handkerchief. Twice already a handsome, stalwart young man, in quest of the priest, had entered the yard and penetrated to where she sat. At first they had exchanged the uncompromising howdy of strangers and nothing more. The second time, finding the priest still absent, he hesitated to go at once. Instead, he stood upon the step, and narrowing his brown eyes, gazed beyond the river, off toward the west, where a murky streak of mist was spreading across the sun. "'It look like mo rain,' he remarked slowly and carelessly. "'We done had about enough,' she replied, in much the same tone. "'It's no chance to thin out the cotton,' he went on. "'And the bon Dieu,' she resumed, it's only today you can cross him on foot. You live yonder on the bon Dieu, don't? He asked, looking at her for the first time since he had spoken. Yes, by Ned Hebert, monsieur. Instinctive courtesy held him from questioning her further. But he seated himself on the step, evidently determined to wait there for the priest. He said no more but sat scanning critically the steps, the porch, and pillar beside him, from which he occasionally tore away little pieces of detached wood where it was beginning to rot at its base. A click on the side gate that communicated with the churchyard soon announced Pierre Antoine's return. He came hurriedly across the garden patch between the tall, lusty rose bushes that lined either side of it, which were now fragrant with blossoms. His long, flapping cassock added something of height to his undersized, middle-aged figure, as did the skull-cap which rested securely back on his head. He saw only the young man at first, who rose at his approach. "'Well, Azenor,' he called cheerily in French, extending his hand, "'how is this? I expected you all week.' "'Yes, monsieur,' but I knew well what you wanted with me, and I was finishing the doors for Gros Lyon's new house. Saying which, he drew back and indicated by a motion and look that someone was present who had prior claim upon Pierre Antoine's attention. Ah, Lely, the priest exclaimed when he had mounted to the porch and saw her there behind the vines. Have you been waiting here since you confessed? Surely an hour ago. Yes, monsieur. "'You should rather have made some visits in the village, child.' "'I am not acquainted with anyone in the village,' she returned. The priest, as he spoke, had drawn a chair and seated himself beside her, with his hands comfortably clasping his knees. He wanted to know how things were out on the bayou. "'And how is the grandmother?' he asked, as cross and crabbed as ever. "'And with that,' he added reflectively, good for ten years yet. I said only yesterday to Boutron, you know Boutron, he works at Les Blos Bon Dieu place, that Madame Zidore, how is it with her, Boutron? I believe God has forgotten her here on earth. 
It isn't that, your reverence, said Boutron, but it's neither God nor the devil that wants her. And Père Antoine laughed with a jovial frankness that shook all sting of ill nature from his very pointed remarks. Lely did not reply when he spoke of her grandmother. She only pressed her lips firmly together and picked nervously at the red bandana. I have come to ask, Monsieur Antoine, she began, lower than she needed to speak, for Azenor had withdrawn at once to the far end of the porch, to ask if you will give me a little scrap of paper, a piece of writing for Monsieur Chartrand at the store over there. I want new shoes and stockings for Easter, and I have brought eggs to trade for them. He says he is willing, yes, if he was sure I would bring more every week till the shoes were paid for. With good-natured indifference, Père Antoine wrote the order that the girl had desired. He was too familiar with distress to feel keenly for a girl who was able to buy Easter shoes and pay for them with eggs. She immediately went away then, after shaking hands with the priest, and sending a quick glance of her pathetic eyes toward Azenor, who had turned when he heard her rise, and nodded when he caught the look. Through the vines he watched her cross the village street. "'How is it that you do not know Lely, Azenor? Surely you must have seen her pass your house often. It lies on her way to the bon Dieu. "'No, I don't know her. I have never seen her.' The young man replied as he seated himself after the priest and kept his eyes absently fixed on the store across the road where he had seen her enter. She is the granddaughter of that Madame Isidore. What? Mame Isidore, whom they drove off that island last winter? Yes, yes. Well, you know, they say the old woman stole wood and things. I don't know how true it is and destroyed people's property out of pure malice. And now she lives on the bon Dieu? Yes, on Le Blois place, in a perfect wreck of a cabin. You see, she gets it for nothing. Not a negro on the place but has refused to live in it. Surely it can't be that old abandoned hovel near the swamp that Michon occupied ages ago? That is the one, the very one. And the girl lives there with that old wretch? The young man marveled. Old wretch, to be sure, Azenor. But what can you expect from a woman who never crosses the threshold of God's house, who even tried to hinder the child doing so as well? But I went to her, I said. See here, Madame Zedora, you know it's my way to handle such people without gloves. You may damn your soul if you choose, I told her. That is a privilege which we all have, but none of us has a right to imperil the salvation of another. I want to see Lely at Mass hereafter on Sundays, or you will hear from me. And I shook my stick under her nose. Since then the child has never missed a Sunday. But she is half starved, you can see that. You saw how shabby she is, how broken her shoes are. She is at Chartrand's now trading for new ones with those eggs she brought, poor thing. There's no doubt of her being ill-treated. Bertrand says he thinks Madame Zedore even beats the child. I don't know how true it is, for no power can make her utter a word against her grandmother. Azenor, whose face was a kind and sensitive one, had paled with distress as the priest spoke. And now, at these final words, he quivered as though he felt the sting of a cruel blow upon his own flesh. But no more was said of Lely, for Pierre Antoine drew the young man's attention to the carpenter work which he wished to entrust to him. When they had talked the matter over in all its lengthy details, Asnor mounted his horse and rode away. A moment's gallop carried him outside the village, then came a half-mile strip along the river to cover, and then the lane to enter in which stood his dwelling midway upon a low, pleasant knoll. As Azenor turned into the lane, 
he saw the figure of Lely far ahead of him. Somehow he had expected to find her there, and he watched her again as he had done through Père Antoine's vines. When she passed his house, he wondered if she would turn to look at it. But she did not. How could she know it was his? Upon reaching it himself, he did not enter the yard, but stood there motionless, his eyes always fastened upon the girl's figure. He could not see, away off there, how coarse her garments were. She seemed through the distance that divided them as slim and delicate as a flower stalk. He stayed till he reached the turn of the lane and disappeared into the woods. Mass had not yet begun when Azenar tiptoed into church on Easter morning. He did not take his place for the congregation, but stood close to the holy water font and watched the people who entered. Almost every girl who passed him wore a white mull, a dotted Swiss, or a fresh starched muslin at least. They were bright with ribbons that hung from their persons and flowers that bedecked their hats. Some carried fans and cambric handkerchiefs. Most of them wore gloves and were odorant of poudre de riz and nice toilet waters, while all carried gay little baskets filled with Easter eggs. But there was one who came empty-handed, save for the worn prayer book which she bore. It was Lely, the veil upon her head, and wearing the blue print and cotton bodice which she had worn the day before. He dipped his hand to the holy water when she came, and held it out to her, though he had not thought of doing this for the others. She touched his fingers with the tips of her own, making a slight inclination as she did so, and after a deep genuflection before the blessed sacrament, passed on to the side. He was not sure if she had known him. He knew she had not looked into his eyes, for he would have felt it. He was angered against the other young women who passed him because of their flowers and ribbons when she wore none. He himself did not care, but he feared she might, and watched her narrowly to see if she did. But it was plain that Lely did not care. Her face, as she seated herself, settled into the same restful lines it had worn yesterday, when she sat in Père Antoine's big chair. It seemed good to her to be there. Sometimes she looked up at the little colored panes through which the Easter sun was streaming, then at the flaming candles like stars, or at the embowered figures of Joseph and Mary flanking the central tabernacle which shrouded the risen Christ. Yet she liked just as well to watch the young girls in their spring freshness, or to sensuously inhale the mingled odor of flowers and incense that filled the temple. Lely was among the last to quit the church. When she walked down the clean pathway that led from it to the road, she looked with pleased curiosity towards groups of men and maidens who were gaily matching their Easter eggs under the shade of the china berry trees. Azenor was among them, and when he saw her coming solitary down the path, he approached her, and with a smile extended his hat, whose crown was quite lined with the pretty colored eggs. "'You must have forgot to bring eggs,' he said. "'Take some of mine.' "'No merci,' she replied, flushing and drawing black. But he urged them anew upon her. Much pleased, then, she bent her pretty head over the hat, and was evidently puzzled to make a selection among so many that were beautiful. He picked one out for her, a pink one, dotted with white clover leaves. Yeah, he said, handing it to her, I think this is the purty, and it looks strong, too. I'm sure it will break all of the rest. And he playfully held out another, half hidden in his fist, for her to try its strength upon. But she refused to. She would not risk the ruin of her pretty egg. Then she walked away without once having noticed that the girls, whom Asnor had left, were looking curiously at her. When he rejoined them, he was hardly prepared for their greeting. It startled him. How come you two talk to that girl? She's real canal, her. 
That's what one of them said to him. Who say so? Who say she's can kneel? If it's a man, I'll smash his head, he exclaimed, livid. They all laughed merrily at this. And if it's a lady, I's a newer, what you going to do about it? Asked another quizzingly. Tain't no lady. No lady would say that about a poor girl what she don't even know. He turned away and emptying all his eggs into the head of a little urchin who stood near, walked out of the churchyard. He did not stop to exchange another word with anyone, neither with the men who stood all on the march before the stores, nor the women who were mounting upon horses and into vehicles or walking in groups to their homes. He took a short cut across the cotton field that extended back of the town, and walking rapidly soon reached his home. It was a pleasant house of a few rooms and many windows, with fresh air blowing through from every side. His workshop was beside it. A broad strip of greensward, studded here and there with trees, sloped down to the road. Agenor entered the kitchen, where an amiable old black woman was chopping onion and sage at a table. Tranquiline, he said abruptly, there's a young girl going to pass here after a while. She's got a blue dress with a white josie on it and a veil on her head. When you see her, I want you to go to the road and make her rest there on the bench and ask her if she don't want a cup of coffee. I saw her go to the communion meet, and so she didn't eat any breakfast. Everybody else from other town that went to communion got invited somewhere or another. It's enough to make a person sick to see such meanness. And you want me to go to her down to the gate, list so, and ax her pine blank if she wants some coffee? asked the bewildered tranquilly. I don't care if you ask her point blank or not, but you do like I say. Tranquiline was leaning over the gate when Laylee came by. Howdy, offered the woman. Howdy, the girl returned. Did you see a yellow calf with black spots on tarm coming down the lane, Missy? No, not yellow, and not with black spot. May I seen one little white calf tied by the rope yonder round the bend? I thought warn't hit. This here one was yellow. I hope he done flung hisself down the bank and broke his neck. Sarve him right. But where you come from, child? You look plumb woe out. Sit down there on that bench and let me fetch you a cup of coffee. Azenor had already in his eagerness arranged a tray upon which was a smoking cup of café au lait. He had buttered and jellied generous slices of bread and was searching wildly for something when Tranquiline re-entered. What become of that half a chicken pie, Tranquiline, that was here in the guard manger today? Why chicken pie? What garden manger? blustered the woman. Like we got more'n one garden manger in the house, Tranquiline? You just like old Mama Azanora used to be, you is. You speck chicken pot pie guan last eternal. When something done spilled, I flings it away. That's me. That's Tranquiline. So Azanor resigned himself, what could he do, and sent the tray incomplete as he fancied it out to Laylee. He trembled at the thought of what he did, he whose nerves were usually as steady as some piece of steel mechanism. Would it anger her if she suspected? Would it please her if she knew? Would she say this or that to Tranquiline, and would Tranquiline tell him truly what she said and how she looked? As it was Sunday, Agenor did not work that afternoon. Instead, he took a book out under the trees, as he often did, and sat reading it from the first sound of the vesper bell that came faintly across the fields till the Angelus all that time. He turned many a page, yet in the end did not know what he had read. With his pencil he had traced Lely upon every margin, and was saying it softly to himself. Another Sunday Agenor saw Lely at Mass, and again. Once he walked with her and showed her the shortcut across the cotton field. She was very glad that day, and told him she was going to work. Her grandmother said she might. So she was going to hoe, 
up in the fields with Monsieur Le Blanc's hands. He entreated her not to, and when she asked his reason, he could not tell her, but turned and tore shyly and savagely at the elder blossoms that grew along the fence. Then they stopped for she was going to cross the fence from the field to the lane. He wanted to tell her that was his house, which they could see not far away. But he did not dare to, since he had fed her on the morning she was hungry. And you say your grandma's going to let you work? She keeps you from working, don't? He wanted to question her about her grandmother, and could think of no other way to begin. Poor old grandma, she answered. I don't believe she knows most of the time what she's doing. Sometimes she say I ain't no better than one nigger, and she forced me to work. Then she say she know I'm going to be one canal like mamma, and she make me sit down still, like she would want to kill me if I would move. Her, she only want to be out in the wood, day and night, day and night. She ain't got her right head, poor grandma. I know she ain't. Lely had spoken in low and in jerks, as if every word gave her a pain. Agenor could feel her distress as plainly as he saw it. He wanted to say something to her, to do something for her, but her presence paralyzed him into inactivity, except his pulses that beat like hammers when he was with her. Such a poor, shabby little thing as she was, too. "'I'm going to wait year next Sunday for you, Lele,' he said, when the fence was between them, and he thought he had said something very daring. But the next Sunday she did not come. She was neither at the appointed place of meeting in the lane, nor was she at Mass. Her absence, so unexpected, affected Asenor like a calamity. Late in the afternoon, when he could stand the trouble and bewilderment of it no longer, he went and leaned over Père Antoine's fence, the priest was picking the slugs from his roses on the other side. "'That young girl from the Bon Dieu,' said Azenur, "'she was not at Mass today. "'I suppose her grandmother has forgotten your warning.' "'No,' answered the priest. "'The child is ill, I hear. "'Boutron tells me she has been ill for several days "'from overwork in the fields. "'I shall go out tomorrow to see about her.' I would go today if I could. The child is ill, was all that Agenor heard or understood of Père Antoine's words. He turned and walked resolutely away, like one who determines suddenly upon action after meaningless hesitation. He walked towards his home and passed it as if it were a spot that did not concern him. He went on down the lane and into the wood where he had seen Lely disappear that day. Here all was shadow, for the sun had dipped too low in the west to send a single ray through the dense foliage of the forest. Now that he had found himself on the way to Lely's home, he strove to understand why he had not gone there before. He often visited other girls in the village and neighborhood. Why not have gone to her? well. The answer lay too deep in his heart for him to be more than half conscious of it. Fear had kept him, dread to see her desolate life face to face. He did not know how he could bear it. But now he was going to her at last. She was ill. He would stand upon that dismantled porch that he could just remember. Doubtless Mamsidor would come out to know his will, and he would tell her that Père Antoine had sent to inquire how Mademoiselle Lely was. No, why drag in Père Antoine? He would simply stand boldly and say, Madame Zidor, I learn that Lely is ill. I have come to know if it is true, and to see her if I may. When Azenor reached the cabin, where Lely dwelt, all signs of day had vanished. Dusk had fallen swiftly after the sunset. The moss that hung heavy from the great live oak branches was making fantastic silhouettes against the eastern sky, 
that the big round moon was beginning to light. Off in the swamp beyond the bayou, hundreds of dismal voices were droning in a lullaby. Upon the hovel itself, a stillness like death arrested. Oftener than once, Azenor tapped on the door, which was closed as well as it could be, without obtaining a reply. He finally approached one of the small, unglazed windows in which coarse mosquito netting had been fastened and looked into the room. By the moonlight slanting in, he could see Lely stretched upon a bed. But of Madame Zadora there was no sign. Lely, he called softly. Lely. The girl slightly moved her head upon the pillow. Then he boldly opened the door and entered. Upon a wretched bed, over which was spread a cover of patched calico, Lely lay, her frail body only half concealed by the single garment which was upon it. One hand was plunged beneath her pillow, the other which was free he touched. It was as hot as flame, so was her head. He knelt sobbing upon the floor beside her, and called her his love and his soul. He begged her to speak a word to him, to look at him. But she only muttered disjointedly that the cotton was all turning to ashes in the fields, and blades of corn were in flames. If he was choked with love and grief to see her so, he was moved by anger as well, rage against himself, against Père Antoine, against the people upon the plantation and in the village who had so abandoned a helpless creature to misery and maybe death. Because she had been silent, had not lifted her voice in complaint, they believed she suffered no more than she could bear. But surely the people could not be utterly without heart. There must be one somewhere with the Spirit of Christ. Père Antoine would tell him of such a one, and he would carry Lely to her, out of this atmosphere of death. He was in haste to be gone with her. He fancied every moment of delay was a fresh danger threatening her life. He folded the rude bed-cover over Lely's naked limbs and lifted her in his arms. She made no resistance. She seemed only loath to withdraw her hand from beneath the pillow. When she did, he saw that she held lightly but firmly grasped in her encircling fingers the pretty Easter egg he had given her. He uttered a low cry of exultation as the full significance of this came over him. If she had hung for hours upon his neck telling him that she loved him, he could not have known it more surely than by this sign. Azenor felt as if some mysterious bond had all at once drawn them heart to heart and made them one. No need now to go from door to door begging admittance for her. She was his. She belonged to him. He knew now where her place was, whose roof must shelter her, and whose arms protect her. So Azenor, was his loved one in his arms, walked through this forest, sure-footed as a panther. Once as he walked he could hear in the distance the weird chant which Madame de Dor was crooning, to the moon, maybe, as she gathered her wood. Once, where the water was trickling cool through rocks, he stopped to lave Lely's hot cheeks and hands and forehead. He had not once touched his lips to her, but now, when a sudden great fear came upon him, because she did not know him, instinctively he pressed his lips upon hers that were parched and burning. He held them there till hers were soft and pliant from the healthy moisture of his own. Then she knew him. She did not tell him so, but her stiffened fingers relaxed their tense hold upon the Easter bauble. It fell to the ground as she twined her arm around his neck, and he understood. Stay close by her, Tranquilline, said Azenor, when he had laid Lely upon his own couch at home. I'm going for the doctor and for Père Antoine. Not because she's going to die, he added hastily, 
seeing the awe that crept into the woman's face at the mention of a priest she is going to live do you think i would let my wife die tranquilline end of love on the bon dieu